I've learned a whole lot of stuff about Android TV boxes. Hello everyone, Chris here. A couple of weeks ago, we did a video on an Android TV box. I was trying to utilize one of those to control and monitor a 3D printer via Octoprint. I wanted to give it a try because they are very affordable and I wanted to see if I could get it set up to utilize that 3D printer as easily as possible. So I went the route with Octo4a. Octo4a is a great GitHub project that allows you to install a very light Linux OS on top of an Android machine to utilize Octoprint for your 3D printer. It's mainly focused on using Android phones, but it did work on the TV box, but not all that well. There are a lot of features that we couldn't utilize. So I wasn't completely happy with those results, so I started doing a lot of research. And I've learned a whole lot about Android TV boxes. But really all you need to know is it's mainly about the processor that this TV box utilizes. A lot of folks are out there hacking and tweaking different Linux versions for these different boxes, but the processor has a lot to do with it. And in that last video, we were using an H616. It is not as compatible as some of the other processors that are out there. Today we're switching to a different box that has an H6 processor that's much more well supported. So we're going to do it a little bit differently today. We're going to take a look at the box, but we're going to jump right into hacking it to make it do exactly what we want it to do to control our 3D printer in a couple of different ways. So let's jump into it. We'll take a look at the old box and the new box, and I'll show you what the difference is. So here's the box that we used in the last video. It's a T95 box, just like the one we're going to use today. This is actually the newer version. But like I just said, it's all about the processor they use. These are all ARM processors. This one is an all winner H616. And it really doesn't matter much about the processor. It's just how Linux deals with it. The RBM project that is the most common OS that you see that runs on some of these boxes. That's the one we use to hack them. And it just takes time for folks to adopt these different processors. So this one is not supported by the community that well today. Maybe it will be, but there are more common processors that are supported. And that's why today we are going with the T95 mini box. Again, there's not that much difference in between these two, but this one has an H6 processor. It's still an all-winner chip, it is an ARM chip, but it has a lot more support out in the community. A lot more folks have had a hand in trying to configure that ARM being OS to work on this hardware rather than the newer version. In fact, there's already a great guide out there on the internet about making Clipper work on one of these directly. So just keep that in mind if you're doing this. It's very important what processor the box has and how well it's supported out there on the internet. So the long and the short of this whole thing, it comes down to the processor they used when they created one of these devices. The Army website has a ton of great information and folks over there trying to hack different types of Linux to utilize these different pieces of hardware. And that's what it comes down to. You have to have somebody that's willing to dedicate the time to get all that OS updated to support these different devices. And that H6 processor, there's a lot more folks out there working on it than there is the 616. So be careful which processor you get when you're looking at one of these Android TV boxes. They're all about the same price, really. These were both right around $30. But stay away from the 616 for now. Thank you to all the community members, by the way, that work on these devices. It is really interesting to try to hack one, and there's a lot of great information available. So now, let's jump over to the computer Take a look at some of the resources that I found while I was trying to do this whole thing. So being able to hack one of these boxes like we're going to do today, a lot of it has been dependent on the RBM effort. Basically, they're trying to make Linux easy to run on these ARM devices. On their forum, there's tons of awesome information, and there's a whole section about TV boxes. There's different ones that are supported. They even have direct links to download images that you can install on the boxes that are known to work. Also, updates on projects and their advancement and how close they are to get a full working version of an OS that'll work on specific pieces of hardware. Tons of hard work done out here by these individuals. And the process that we're going to walk through today, both my buddy Dave Wilson 
and Chris Russell have sent me this same article running over this T95 mini TV box and this clipper install. It gives you a lot of the steps that you need to use and even warns you about this H616 processor, but it's mainly focused on clipper and that's definitely a route that you can go. But you can run pretty much anything on this as long as we get over to a viable version of Linux. So a lot of the things we're going to do today are outlined right here in this doc. All this will be linked in the description. At the bottom of this page, there is a link to support their efforts. Definitely consider it. There's a lot of great open source projects out here. So by now, some of you are probably saying, why? Why are we doing this, Chris? Well, the first reason, I enjoy it. I think it's a lot of fun to try to do things like this. But the second is basically the cost of a Raspberry Pi. We utilize the Pis to run a lot of different things that run Raspbian, including Clipper and Octoprint. So if we can take one of these boxes that only cost 30 bucks and do the same thing, why not? Also, that walkthrough that I showed you, they're using Kai to help you install Clipper on this RBM OS. We're just going to go straight OS and try a few things out. Basically, just walking you through parts of that walkthrough. So we'll see what we can do. We'll see how the video goes. See what we can install on one of these boxes. Let's start by just booting up this box and seeing what's on it, because that's probably the last time we're going to see the default OS that's been loaded from the factory. So all I did was hook up HDMI and the power cable. I don't know why, but I felt the need to go ahead and boot it up to see what it does by default. I did buy it after all. So let's just see what it does. T95 Mini, cool graphic, and pretty much your standard Android OS blocky menu that I've seen on tons of different devices. So that's all fine and good, but this really isn't any good to us. So let's start hacking it. So let's get started by unpacking some of the things that this tutorial is talking about with this T95 box. We have to do a few things here. The first being getting an image that will run on this T95 box, installing it on an SD card, flashing it to the box, all that good stuff. There's a company that's already selling these boxes with this OS already flashed as a computer replacement, and they're very affordable. But they pretty much have to offer that software for free. It's all open source. So that's where this article tells you to download it from. You can see this company's site. They're offering this Quadera. They're comparing it to a Raspberry Pi for $35. It's basically just this TV box that we're using here today. But that would make it pretty easy. Again, it's offered as a desktop replacement. It has a GUI and everything installed. And they have a special section that they talk about installing this on your own TV box if you wish. But this custom image does make it a lot easier to get up and running. They put in a lot of work here. So we're going to give this image a try first because it's readily available. So we're just going to download it from the link that was provided in this tutorial. No sense in reinventing the wheel when we don't have to. Here's a link to it right here. When the download is complete, you can use your Raspberry Pi tool. You will need an SD card to flash it. I recommend using a 16 gig card so you have lots of room. Just choose your OS, go down to use custom, and then select that image file that we just downloaded. Choose your storage. There's our SD card and then hit write. It is going to delete everything that's on that card. So we have our image on our SD card, and this is really the only special sauce that we have to know to get this to work. But I highly suggest that you grab a keyboard and a mouse and a hub so that we can use all this at the same time. You can do this a couple of different ways. We could use the screen and use the terminal, and we could also plug it into our network and go in SSH. So we're going to take a look at both. I'll try to walk you through them the best I can. So to start out here, we're just going to have a terminal. The big secret is you don't want to plug in anything HDMI. You don't want to monitor on this as of now. That will stop the install. I got this directly from the guide. But I've got my hub with my mouse and my keyboard on it. We've got our image on our SD card. We're going to put that over here in the slot. And then we're going to plug it in and power it on. When it powers up, you're going to see that red LED. That lets us know it's booting from the SD card. It's going to take a while. The guide says 7 to 30 minutes, but this should turn blue. 
So we'll give it a second. So patience is your friend with this thing, but it did finally turn blue. It took a little over 10 minutes. You don't really think it's doing anything, but then all of a sudden it seems like it is. So we have a couple of options, like I said before, but you could just go ahead and plug in a hardwired ethernet cable to your new box and then to your router and try to get the IP and log in SSH. Or we can connect a screen and get a desktop. And I want to do that just to see what's going on with that. So we're going to power it off. We're going to plug in a monitor, HDMI. We already have our keyboard and mouse. And then we'll pull the SD card out. Then we can boot back up. So now we're back to the camera that I have pointed at my screen. We've rebooted and we're up and running. Quadera is the default username, but you will have to have the default password. This is in the guide, but it's all lowercase 1N0V at sign T0. Hit enter. So we have this nice desktop. It looks great. You could use this as a computer, but we don't really need to do that. What we want to do is to be able to log in SSH and we want it to be on the network so we can control our 3D printer headless, meaning we don't need a keyboard, mouse, or monitor. But from here, the nice part is that we can add this to the wireless network so we don't have to use a cable and we can use the keyboard and mouse to do that. We don't have to set up configuration files. So I know this is going to be hard to see, but if you come up here to the corner, there's two arrows. If you click on that, you can go to Wi-Fi networks. You can see here's our Wi-Fi network right here. And then you can just punch in your Wi-Fi password and hit connect. So now our new TV box is on the network. You can see the antenna is full. But not every user on this machine has access to that Wi-Fi network. So you need to change a couple of things real quick. So right click on that Wi-Fi antenna and let's go to edit connections. So we'll select our new Wi-Fi network, the one we just connected. We'll double click on it. And here's all the info about that network. The first thing you need to change is go to general and tick this box. All users may connect to this network. That way, this network interface is gonna come up when you boot the box. If not, you'd have to log into the desktop to get that to work. So let's just go ahead and save that real quick to make sure that's correct. But let's double click again. Linux has a really bad habit of getting a new IP every time it boots. So you'd be much better off setting a static IP. And you can do that right from here in IPv4 settings. You can see it's set to automatic DHCP. You can switch it to manual. But I would set it to the same IP that it has initially grabbed. So the box is currently using a Wi-Fi IP. I would just use the same one to set it static so you don't have multiple IPs on the same network. That causes a lot of problems. So let's cancel out of this just for a second. We'll close this and just go back up to your Wi-Fi antenna, right click connection information. We're currently on IP 192.168.1.2. Take note of your subnet mask. This is going to be the most common for home networks as well as your gateway 1.1. So close this once again, we're going to be on 1.2. Right click the Wi-Fi antenna again, edit connections, back to where we were, go to IPv4, we're going to flip it from automatic to manual, and then we're going to add our address. Just hit add, 192.168.1.2, netmask, you saw it was 255.255.255.0. And then our gateway, 192.168.1.1. Now we'll have a static IP. It'll be this IP every time it comes up. Go ahead and hit save. Now we should be done with our desktop. We can go back to our computer, open up PuTTY, and log in SSH with that IP. So now that our TV box is on the network, we can just use our PuTTY tool, like we do for a lot of these projects, and we can log into it. So we'll use that IP, 192.168.1.2, and you use the same credentials that we did for the desktop. That username is QADRA. Password, once again, is 1N0V at T0.
Now, the first thing that I want to do is create my own user. You could just change this password, but I don't want to have to remember the username. I have a common username I use for most of the servers. I just use my first name. So I want to add that user so we can use it going forward. So we're going to do sudo user add, and then the username you want to add. I'm just going to add Chris. And we'll have to punch in that password one more time for the default user. And we've added our username. So now I'm going to set the password for that new account. I'm going to jump to root with su space dash. Punch in your default password one more time. And then I'm going to do passwd and then our new username, Chris. We'll set the new password and the password has been updated. And then one last thing we want to do is make sure that Chris is part of the sudo username. So we want a user mod, user mod dash a capital G space sudo and then your new username, Chris. Now Chris can use sudo as root. So we can exit out of root and now you can close this and log in as Chris. That's probably the easiest way. We were able to log in as Chris. We didn't create the home directory. We should have done that, but that's easy to fix. I'm just going to mkdir make dir forward slash home forward slash Chris. Had to use sudo, but now we can cd to tilde pwd and we have a home account. This is where you want everything to be pretty much when you're doing all of these installs in your home directory. So now we have the Linux OS up and running. We can pretty much do anything we want with this box at this point. So the hard part is done. The TV box is up and running Linux. Now we can just use any of the other tutorials that I've made to install whatever you want. You can go straight Octoprint. You can go Clipper. It, there's a lot of different things you can do here. You can use it for a completely different reason if you want to. But next, I do want to go ahead, step through Octoprint, see how it comes up, make sure we can use the camera and all that good stuff. So now I'm going to plug in the printer and the camera, and then we'll go on with our configuration. So we should be ready to go. I plugged in the camera into one USB port and the printer in the other. Just for fun, let's do an ls forward slash dev to see what's present. There's TTY ACM0. That's probably the printer. And then we have various video over here. One of those I'm sure is the camera. But the nice part about what we're going to do next is what I've shown in previous videos. We're going to use Paul's script. It will work on Armbian just like this and it will install Octoprint and everything for us. Now, a lot of these installs are cut down, so you do have to install the Git tool to be able to use it to pull in things from GitHub. So let's just make sure it's there. sudo apt install git. So it did have it. We're good there. And then we'll use git to clone Paul's script from GitHub. I'll just leave this one line command in the description as well, but I do have a video on how to do this whole process. But we'll just hit it to bring it in. I did have to ch own my home directory because I created it as the sudo account. So if you run into that issue, it won't let you download. Just do sudo ch own username group, same thing, and then forward slash home forward slash Chris. Then it'll let you download things to it. We got a permission error. But from there, then you can just run Paul's script after it's been downloaded. sudo octoprint deploy forward slash octoprint underscore deploy dot sh. And we want to prepare our system, number one. And we are running number two, Debian. It just happens to be an Armbian version, but all these will work the same. We are ready to begin. It only takes a couple of minutes. It's getting everything ready with Python, all that good stuff for this install. And for this install, I am going to use haproxy. So let's give it a yes. We'll use MJPEG Streamer for our camera, so we'll install that. And then we'll go ahead and set up our Octoprint user. Chris and password. And we'll go ahead and run through the Octoprint wizard right here from command line. Online connectivity check, yes. Blacklist, yes. Anonymous user tracking, sure. Use the default printer, yes. No plugins for me for now. No cloud service for now. So the Octoprint install is complete. Now we need to add the instance so that we can use our printer. So we'll just do one. This is our Mark III. Default values, yes. 
and then we're going to begin the auto detect. So I'm just going to unplug the printer USB and then plug it back in. It was able to find it. It sees the serial number. We would like to go ahead and try to auto detect a USB camera. So we'll hit yes. We'll add the camera to HA proxy. Yes. This is so you can talk to them by name, but we'll unplug that camera and then plug it back in. It found the camera by serial number and it's just going to increment it to the next port, so we're fine with that. We'll just hit enter. We can leave it the default resolution for now. You can update all of that later. Frame rate, same way. And we're ready to write all the changes. Yes. And Octoprint is set up ready to go. We can head to a browser and go ahead and log in and make sure everything's working correctly. With Paul's script for Octoprint, we can just use the IP, we already know that, 192.168.1.2, and then you can forward slash the name of the instance that we created. Ours was Mark 3. And then we should see Octoprint. It's already connected to the printer, ready to go. And then if you go to Control tab, you should be able to see your camera. Now, one thing on my install that I noticed earlier is that it was having problems resolving DNS. And if that was the case during the install, that could have caused more problems than just Octoprint having issues. Like you didn't get the correct repos for some packages. So just quick and dirty to fix something like that, what I would do, go back to command line. This is just side tips in case you see them. But you can go to sudo nano forward slash etc forward slash resolve dot conf and you can add some name servers in here and I usually just add the Google servers but all you have to do is name server space then the IP Google service servers are 8.8.8.8.8.4.4 but that will resolve your DNS issues you can just control X Y enter to save now you have some DNS servers to prove that to make sure it's working I just do sudo apt update so it tries to contact the direct repos and it can now so we should have fixed that issue if there was one again just a side tip and I also want to do a quick reboot to make sure everything comes up as expected after the reboot it looks like the printer is fine but then if you head to control tab sometimes the webcam doesn't want to start so I wanted to do some troubleshooting to make it a little more consistent if you head back to putty and do a sudo system ctl status and then whatever you name that camera during the install mine is called cam underscore mk3 you can see we have some timeouts here so there might be something we can do to correct that but I'm just gonna do a restart here just by replacing status with restart and do a quick status and it looks like it comes up clean the second time so now it's working so there's probably something we can alter really quick in the config to make this more consistent now what I'm gonna show you here is extra bonus points you shouldn't have to do this and this isn't the proper way to edit a service in Linux but just to get it up and going and consistently I just edited that service so when you do the status it's going to give you the location of that service you can see it right here that's the service file I'm just going to do a sudo nano and edit that now you should be using some sort of override file but here's the execute start command I'm just going to increase the timeout for mjpeg streamer I'm just going to do dash timeout and I'm going to make it 30 seconds that should cause the camera to not time out so quickly and should get it up and running so control X Y enter to save and then you have to reload the daemon to get it to work just do system can tell daemon reload and that's going to get your camera up and running now it'll work on reboot again not the best way this is totally dependent on this TV box it's interacting with the devices a certain way maybe it's a little slow try the Ustreamer from Paul's script it's a lot more robust I talked to Paul about it a little bit 
that might be a better way to go than trying to hack this. But every device is going to be a little bit different. It's just an added tip if you run into a problem. So just to confirm that everything's working correctly, I want to run a quick print and do a time lapse and make sure all of that is going to work out. So let's do that now. And just a quick note to get the time lapse going, I did have to change the snapshot URL down here in settings, webcam settings, from localhost to 127.0.0.1. I don't know why it didn't like localhost, but this did get it going. Also, path to FFmpeg, it wasn't filled in, it was just blank. But it is the default location, forward slash user, forward slash bin, forward slash FFmpeg. It was there, it just wasn't filled in. So if your time lapse isn't working correctly, this is probably why. It's probably just how Paul's script works, but not that big a deal. Just remember to fill it in. Now we can head to the time lapse. <laughs> So everything seems to be working just fine for the Octoprint install, but let's talk about the Kaya install just for a second. I don't want to get really involved in it, that could be a whole other video, but it's pretty easy to set up as well. For the Kaya install, this web page that we've been following loosely, it gives you all the steps you need to install that. It's almost like Paul's script, it's just a helper for Clipper instead. But you do a git clone for Kaya, we'll just grab the command. That brings it down to your TV box, and then you can just run the script, kaya.sh. And it's going to bring you a menu, and you can do whatever you want from here. So if you just hit 1 to do the install, we can just hit 1 for Clipper. We're going to use Python 3, and we're just going to do one instance. After Clipper's installed, Python, all that good stuff, then just do Moonraker. Just, you just move through all these options, we'll do two. Moonraker's done, then you can put in whatever front end you like, mainsail, fluid, let's just do mainsail, that's the one I prefer. Mainsail's done, you can do a lot of other things in this menu, but we'll just go back, and we'll quit. And we don't have a printer installed with Clipper or anything like that, but now we're ready to get there. So if you head to that IP we were using for Octoprint now, you have mainsail, you're ready to start your Clipper install. So our TV box is doing its job on multiple firmwares. So there it is, the T95 mini box with the H6 processor. I was able to configure multiple configurations, one with Octoprint and Paul's script, and then the Kaya install for Clipper. I'm sure you could even do multiple 3D printers. After you get that Armbian installed, that OS flashed on this box, you can pretty much go in any direction you want. It's a pretty stable OS, you saw the desktop, you could even use it for a PC. But that's really not what we do here. Also, I did run into a few issues as far as Linux is concerned. I had to get around a few things. Hopefully I showed a lot of the tricks that I used. Hopefully that will help you on your install. Also, there are a lot of people involved here. All the people that do the RMBN project, Paul with his script, the Kaya tool, all of that stuff is put together, open source, by people in their spare time. So thanks to everybody that was involved in making some of this happen. Hopefully you liked this video, that will be it for today, and I'll see you really soon on the next one.